there are some real lessons learned to come from this. Number one, you have to, you must have a clear understanding of what your environments are um, very, very early into the mission if you can do it. Uh, Ares 1X was a little unique. We um, designed, built, integrated, and launched this vehicle in three years. Um, this is a brand new vehicle. This is the first time that uh, NASA has done this in a long time, up to 30 years it seems. And, and uh, to understand the dynamics of this rocket and the environments of this rocket, especially since we're, we were taking um, initial shuttle components, the SRB, and putting those into a, an environment that they have never been analyzed for. It was very uh, challenging for us to understand that. So it's not, um, it's not hard to understand how these environments were not understood until late in the, the program, but we really needed to have those because all of our design depended on those environments. And each load cycle that we went through, we had to go through a complete real reevaluation of, of every system that those, those um, loads were used in the design for. Another lesson that, that I feel we can take from this is the use of heritage components it may be very constraining. Um, we used the Heritage Shuttle FTS, Flight Termination System. Uh, it was designed and uh, flown on shuttle every single, flutl, shuttle, every single shuttle flight. Um, the system itself is qualified to a certain level. Um, and unless we, you can understand those environments, your environments for your vehicle, and can ensure that they are going to be enveloped, by the same levels that shuttle flies to, you open up yourself to the risk of having to do reanalysis, having to, to try to push waivers through the range. And when you push a waiver through the range for, for a public safety waiver, you not only have to go through the chief of safety, but you also have to go up through the KSC center director and the 45th Space Wing commander and the, um, the mission program, uh, program manager for your mission, whatever mission you're flying. So. The other aspect, the very subtle aspect a lot of people don't realize is if you do use a heritage shuttle or heritage system and something happens, then you do, there is the possibility of any indications from that system, any, any concerns with that system being transferred back to the um, base program. And you could actually um, ground that program until those uh, concerns are, are taken care of. That's one of the bigger things that we fa face with shuttle, you know, having shuttle as our base program, it was uh, extremely important, especially with the, um, you know, the end of shuttle coming up very close. It was extremely important that we did not impact shuttle flights at all. So if we had flown and exceeded um, for the safe and arm for any of the CRDs, batteries, any of the components that fly on shuttle, especially if it was if it was just barely over what the shuttle environments have qualified to, then it could be an implication back on shuttle and the 45th actually could ground shuttle until we discovered what was going on. A third lesson learned that we can take from this, I think, is that <clears throat> you have to have one single point of contact, one conduit for information from your organization to an outside organization such as the 45th. Um, on Ares 1X, we did experience uh, that loads information was uh, provided to the 45th um, through different avenues than just through the, uh, you know, the uh, range safety point of contact. Because of this, the 45th heard uh, different stories or differing stories about our loads at differing times. And the confidence that the 45th had in our, our program being able to analyze those loads really uh, suffered because uh, they'd heard different things at different times. And um, a lot of the information that they had heard was in incorrect and uh, very, very, very preliminary. So it wasn't until after we were able to finally get a load set that everyone could agree on that um, we should have taken it to the, to the 45th at that time rather than trying to release information on different avenues. So I think it's very important to make sure that you have a very clearly defined um, avenue for information. Okay, my name is Jim Price. I was the uh, Flight and Integration Manager for the Ares 1X uh, Systems Engineering, Engineering and Integration Office here at Langley. Um, my responsibilities uh, in that uh, aspect where I also was the, the range safety point of contact, um, my responsibilities really were from the time that the uh, rocket rolled out of the VAB, got on the pad, launched, and recovery and mission ops uh, were the areas that I was responsible for.
The risk we were concerned about was given the possibility that our FTS environments uh, may exceed those which the uh, Heritage Shuttle FTS environments were qualified to, uh, that uh, we could experience something even as, as tragic as uh, uh, FTS safing, inadvertent safing, or even if it did safe, you know, we didn't know whether we would be able to actually trust that that safing um, signal that we got back from the rocket was true. This risk came to light uh, mainly because uh, we did not have a full understanding of our flight environments until late in the mission. Because of this, we found that during the time frame, let's say from T plus or launch plus uh, 80 seconds to launch plus 120 seconds, there was a very big possibility that we would exceed the uh, qualification limits that the shuttle uh, FTS system was qualified to. Because of that, of course, we uh, were concerned that the safe and arm may safe inadvertently, and again, that we would get a uh, signal back from the vehicle itself that we certainly couldn't trust because it had already gone through uh, an environment which, to which it wasn't qualified. So essentially what that meant, meant to us that uh, during that time frame, we had to, because the range area of responsibility was all the way to 120 seconds at that time, the range needed to know that we could have uh, flight termination if they sent their pulse, if the MIFCO sent the pulse, that the flight termination system would work uh, when it was meant to work. Um, because of our trajectory, because of uh, our azimuth, we were able to determine that post 90 seconds in our flight, we really, there was no way possible uh, due to physics of the vehicle itself that we could pose any threat to uh, public safety. So if, if the um, vehicle did experience these flight environments which were above the shuttle flight environments, um, even a signal coming back from the FTS which said that the vehicle was safe, we really couldn't trust because we wouldn't know whether that vehicle, that safe signal coming back was um, uh, because it actually did save or was it, whether there was an error in the, the flight term, I mean, the, the safe arm itself. So there's a very real possibility that we could have an armed vehicle in the water and divers going into the water towards this armed, armed vehicle. And if some other anomaly could happen and you actually had any kind of a detonation of linear shape charge when those divers were in the water, the uh, shock in the water could cause uh, harm or even death to those divers. To mitigate this risk, we took a multi-prong approach, which consisted of analysis, test, and investigation. So the first, first thing that we did, of course, was identify the risk, and we took that risk and entered it into the risk system. It became the uh, overall number one system risk, and um, we identified the risk itself and the mitigations there. But what we really did was we looked at what the range itself was defining as their area of, of responsibility. They initially said, my, our area of responsibility is 120 seconds because that's where your vehicle, the, the thrust on your vehicle goes below 40,000 pounds. Um, so what we said was, actually at 90 seconds, there's no way possible that we could endanger public safety. We established that it, uh, when our vehicle reached a uh, thrust of 40,000 pounds or less, that there was no more forward thrust overcoming the momentum of the vehicle itself. So that was the uh, time that we defined as being our separation time. The range defined our separation time as being the end of their uh, area of responsibility. So what we did was instead of the range imposing that requirement on us and we um, challenged that, what we did was really redefined what we felt was the um, last possible second that our vehicle could pose a danger to public safety. So as we analyzed this system and got a better understanding of the system, it became quite clear to us at that point that the 90 seconds really uh, was not where we were going to see the exceedances. They actually were going to happen earlier in our flight between 70 and 80 seconds. Um, our analysis at the point for the 90 seconds showed that we did have um, no possibility, no matter what the vehicle could do, there was no possibility that we could endanger public safety. But at 70 and 80 seconds, we still did have that possibility. So we really had to figure out a mitigation for that. And that drove us to looking at the entire flight termination system itself, because all of the, quali all of the components were qualified to the same level, or at least we thought they were at the time. Um, 
So when we looked at the 70 to 80 seconds and found out that we were going to have to do something else and something more to the system itself, that's when we started looking at a Delta qualification program or pursuing a waiver with the range, which we knew already that the range would not support. When we realized that we were still going to have a problem with trying to push a waiver through to the 45th that they would not support, Delta qualification or some sort of a requalification of the system itself became our, our best option. So we started looking at the whole system, at all of the components, to see whether we had this the same um, exceedance problem with any of the other components, and in, in fact, we did have that, that problem with the other components too. So we went back to the original manufacturers. We looked at uh, um, the usage of, the, of these individual components on other vehicles, and we were able to determine that many of those um, components actually were flown at higher levels and qualified at higher levels than what we originally supposed uh, for the shuttle system. The end result being that almost all of our pyro systems still did, or would come into uh, a qualification on what we felt was our maximum predicted environment. The only problems that we have were in some of our avionic systems, and those were the, the command receiver decoders, the CRDs, and the batteries. We also had a problem with some of our passive components. Uh, the range, the final determination with the range when we negotiated with them, when we did finally find what our final environments were and were able to present those to the range um, and that they accepted those, the final determination was that the range was going to require us to delta qual our active components and not delta qual our passive. We were able to actually uh, produce a waiver that the range would support on that. And the, um, the program for delta qualing the CRDs and the batteries. We were able to define an accelerated test program. Um, we worked with Patrick Air Force Base in the 45th Space Wing. Uh, we met all of their requirements. They did do a reduced uh, thermal cycle for us so that we were able to do that. And within two months of determining what our loads were and getting the, the um, program started, we were able to uh, Delta qualify the CRDs and the batteries.